Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, and welcome to our Global Insights panel today. Uh, today's panel will be welcoming representatives from the American University in Washington, D.C., Warwick University in the U.K., the Institute for Strategic Affairs in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. My name is Anne Fitzgerald, and I'm delighted to be moderating this panel today. Before we begin, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. For those of you who are tuning in from outside of Canada, one of the actions we take here in Canada to advance reconciliation between settler and indigenous peoples is to reflect on our relationship with the land and the continuous process of colonization that deeply impacts on our work. Acknowledging the land is the process of deliberately naming that this is indigenous land and indigenous peoples have a right to this land. The Balsili School of International Affairs is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River, which is the traditional territory of the Adawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. I would also like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on Remembrance Day here in Canada, and Veterans Day in the United States, and uh, similar occasions elsewhere. Today is a day to reflect not just on the horrors of war, but to also remember and honor those soldiers who have died or who have been injured in the line of duty. Human rights, the subject of today's panel, is of course one of the pillars of the post-World War II liberal international order. The founders of the United Nations understood all too well that world peace hinged on the promotion uh, of and the respect for human rights. After the war, human rights took on new prominence in international affairs, and the world has never looked back. To start us off today in this conversation, let's turn to our distinguished panel. Jeff Bachman is a senior professional lecturer at the American University's School of International Service. He is the author of The United States and Genocide, Redefining the Relationship, and the forthcoming The Politics of Genocide from the Genocide Convention to the Responsibility to Protect. Bafakado Bagali Biru has an MA in International Relations from Addis Ababa University and an MA in Theory and Practice of Human Rights from the University of Essex in the UK. He was a lecturer at Deredawa University in Ethiopia and is currently a researcher at the Institute for Strategic Affairs in Addis Ababa. Abby Kendrick is a senior teaching fellow in political economy at the University of Warwick. She has written on the links between the politics of economic ideas and the realization of human rights. Abby has also worked in the system of special procedures of the Human Rights Council, reporting on issues concerning the impact of economic policy reform on women's human rights. Alison Petrozello is a feminist migration researcher and a human rights advocate who is pursuing a PhD in global governance at the Balsili School, where she is affiliated with the International uh, Migration Research Center. Alison has contributed to recent expert consultations by the UN Committees on the Rights of the Child and Migrant Workers and Special Rapporteurs on Violence Against Children and violence against women. Thank you all of you for being here today with us and for sharing your insights. The Human Rights Project has been a really aspirational project. Despite the emergence of a complex human rights regime, we've always struggled to live up to the promise of human rights. Jeff, I would like to start with you and ask, what influence did member permanent members of the UN Security Council have over the development of human rights law in the form of the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide? And have there been practical implications? Thank you, Anne. And thank you to all of you for joining us and my fellow panelists. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things I'll, I'll point out quickly are uh, political groups were protected in the early drafts of the Genocide Convention, and these were removed mainly at the behest of the Soviet Union. You know, arguments were presented like if there's internal insurrection, how will we be able to deal with that and not be politically um, implicated in genocide, essentially being uh, referred to as committing genocide for political motives. Um, but we also saw cultural genocide get removed from the Genocide Convention as well, and this was at the behest of the colonial powers, in particular uh, the United States, the Fran uh, France, and the UK. 
which uh, just one practical implication I can point out now, going back to your land acknowledgement, is that when Canada did its uh, truth commission, uh, it referred to cultural genocide in quotation marks because it said we did all of these things that uh, disrupt indigenous life, indigenous ways of being, um, worldview, cultural heritage, etc. Um, but cultural genocide doesn't actually exist in any legal form. And so um, there's just one example of practical implications. Uh, we could also look at Indonesia and what it did to communists in 1965 and say there's practical implications there. That was a clear cut case of genocide that doesn't actually fall under the legal definition because political groups are not protected. Thank you very much. Abby, to what extent do our ideals and projects like human rights depend on the form of political economy we establish? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And um, I imagine this kind of question um, might seem a bit peculiar to some human rights lawyers. Um, you know, what does human rights what does that have to do with economics? But um, I would argue that human rights have a lot to do with the way that we organise our political economy. And um, what do I mean by political economy? Sort of the way that we organise production, exchange, distribution, uh, you know, what kind of jobs we do, how much we get paid, who's excluded, what happens to the folks who get left behind. Um, I'll try not to get too bogged down in the detail, but the main point that I want to uh, sort of stress is uh, sort of in regard to this connection is that I think the way that we organize their political economy really sets the scene for which ideas we find plausible, which ideas are allowed to flourish and which uh, kind of interpretation of those ideas really holds sway. Um, and so I think we can kind of see this connection if we consider human rights as uh, the moral language when we talk about all kinds of abuses. Um, and in my own work on economic and social rights, uh, it's great to see that these rights have become more or kind of uh, had more attention recently, um, particularly in kind of broader conversations around sufficiency, people having minimum health, minimum education levels and so on. Um, and this, of course, is a, is a good thing. But these conversations, I would argue, can only really take place in what I would call uh, the, the, the universe of political economic discourse that prevails today. And that discourse um, today, at least, has a, has a very neoliberal character where, OK, it's fine to talk about sufficiency so long as this doesn't really disrupt the kind of political economic superstructure. Um, and up to now, human rights have really been sort of silent on that. Um, and I think the reason why is because these two things, political economy, human rights, are really to some extent endogenous. Thank you so much. Befakadu, over to you. Can I ask what, in your view, are the major challenges and threats related to the COVID-19 pandemic era, which have implications on the post-pandemic era. Okay, thank you. Uh, the pandemic has already caused uh, what the UN call uh, wide-ranging and a serious uh, impacts. There is global economic downturn. And uh, in political aspects, we have seen uh, election extension, irregularities, limits on uh, movement and uh, privacy of people. And uh, here around there is also a discussion that uh, democracies are ineffective to deal with such a threat and that we need strong governments like those in China, Singapore, Taiwan, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, among the challenges, we can also mention uh, the issue of vaccine nationalism. Uh, furthermore, in all the countries across the world, the pandemic has exposed and drained the health sector, which do have uh, a lot of implications for human rights. And uh, uh, there is uh, also shift or a kind of hold on structural issues, such as uh, the issue of fair international trade, the issue of reforming W or the issue of uh, reducing external debt. So thanks to the pandemic, all these issues are uh, like on hold and uh, the issue of the pandemic has taken over such structural concerns. And finally, we can also mention the pandemic has exposed inequalities uh, within and uh, between the countries. So if you see the disaggregated data regarding access to vaccines, testing, infection, distribution of uh, necessary health uh, uh, facilities, you see the inequalities which have been like uh, hidden 
for some years. So this could be some of the major challenges and the threats uh, exposed by the pandemic. Thanks so much, Beficado. Allison, tell us, where do you see a systematic weakening or rolling back of rights in your research, particularly your work on civil registration and legal identity? Why is this a matter uh, of concern for geopolitics? Thanks so much, Anne, and it's great to join this panel today. So my research interrogates what I am calling birth registration as bordering practice. So issuance of birth certificates are a part of what is known as civil registration and vital statistics systems, whereby states are to register the existence of newborn babies and facilitate access to identity documentation, starting with that foundational document that's the birth certificate. So these documents are necessary to establish an identity and a nationality, which are fundamental human rights. And now there's more investment than ever in trying to achieve universal birth registration by 2030 as part of the UN Sustainable Development Agenda and the emerging legal identity agenda. So what happens in, in contexts where questions of belonging are unsettled? Um, this may be due to conflict, uh, competing claims over sovereignty, um, the existence of ethnic minority communities that a sovereign power is unwilling to recognize, or contexts of migration and displacement. So my research suggests that a dual movement may be afoot of authorities in many countries facilitating identity documentation for some and denying it to others a given state is unwilling to recognize. So this generates a risk of statelessness for children of the populations I mentioned around the world. Uh, perhaps most worrying is the gradual rolling back of the human right to a nationality and replacement with alternative registers or ad hoc biometric ID documents for those so-called inconvenient populations. And that kind of documentation provides some protection and access to services, but is certainly not a replacement for the durable status of, of citizenship with all the rights protections that affords. So um, the matter enters the realm of the geopolitical from, from the moment a human cannot be recognized as such. Thanks. Thank you, Allison. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated trends that had been reshaping the international order. <laughs> we have arguably seen that um, there's been a weakening of the international order, particularly international law, including law with respect to international human rights. So, Jeff, I want to come back to you. Previously, you talked about the problems with the content of the Genocide Convention. When suspected cases make it before the UN Security Council, despite these textual issues, how have the permanent members typically handled them? Thank you, Anne. Um, you know, it's interesting um, in, in that in the, the book project that's forthcoming, uh, the question was raised, you know, are you a realist or are you a constructivist? And not to get too into to IR talk, um, but, you know, when the Security Council is able to control what is on the agenda um, and through power politics, I think, um, you know, realism really comes into play. But the Security Council members, especially Permanent Five, can't control every single thing that gets onto the agenda. There's emergency sessions. The Secretariat uh, plays a role, uh, the President of the Security Council for that month. And so inevitably, there are cases that get on there where I think, you know, the P5 don't have interests. And that's where they, you know, constructing narratives that are alternative to genocide narratives comes into play. Uh, so if we think about the case of uh, Bangladesh slash East Pakistan in 1971, um, you know, the uh, China and the United States especially focused on a political conflict. They focused on, we need a political settlement. And once India got involved, it became an interstate war. And meanwhile, genocide was being committed in Bangladesh, at least I would argue. Uh, we saw similar things in Rwanda, the focus on international humanitarian law. Um, so there are ways that they tried to situate, you know, genocide is a human rights uh, violation and mass and group based. Um, and so focus on international humanitarian law was a way to focus on the civil conflict. And I'll just briefly, quickly say that uh, in the case of uh, Bosnia, um, through the omission of cultural genocide and other uh, forms of persecution, uh, they were able to focus on ethnic cleansing and land grabs and so on to avoid recognizing genocide there as well. Thank you. Um, Allison. back to you on COVID-19 and the impact on migrants and their families. So you do research in Latin America and the Caribbean. How, have, uh, how are the rights, the human rights of migrants being affected? And are there any promising practices for upholding migrants' rights? 
So as in many regions of the world, um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, COVID-19 travel restrictions meant that many migrants found themselves stranded in host countries, unemployed, yet unable to return home. And many, many visa holders or temporary migrants, as well as non-status people and asylum seekers, um, were ineligible for emergency assistance from the government. So they were attempting to eke out a living in the informal street economy, and that also was criminalized as a violation of public health orders. Um, unable to pay rent, many lost their housing. And so we saw dramatic scenes of multiply displaced Venezuelans attempting to walk home from across Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, only to have their human right to return to their own country violated. Um, the right to return was also infringed upon for Nicaraguans, stranded at their border with, coast, um, with Costa Rica. Um, and what hap what's happening at the US-Mexico border goes without saying, um, the right to seek asylum has been weakened everywhere. Um, and now increasing restriction in the name of biosecurity makes it all the harder to move and seek humanitarian protection. Um, in terms of hum uh, promising practices, there's just a few I'd like to flag. Um, first, many governments across the region have redoubled their efforts to ensure migrants' right to health care during the pandemic. And access to vaccination um, had been hindered by documentation requirements in many places, though a lot of countries are now realizing the folly of that logic and are um, ensuring access to vaccine. Um, second, Colombia is making grand efforts to regularize the status of Venezuelans in country and to register the births of their children and confer Colombian nationality for those born there since the crisis began in 2015. And I'm not sure how many of our viewers realize that displacement from the Venezuelan crisis now outnumbers that of Syria at roughly 6 million. So many of those folks are unable to access or renew their passports, which are needed both for travel purposes and for registering the births of their children. So what happens when millions of displaced people who continue to have babies cannot register them? And finally, I'll just share a, a quick uh, good practice since I think we're focusing on a lot of ways in which the, the, the rights regime has been weakened. Um, from Uruguay, where the Ministry of Social Development was handing out emergency food baskets to people in need during the pandemic and were surprised to find so many um, migrants who could not meet the minimum requirement of showing a national ID. But instead of turning them away, they gave them the aid and then set about facilitating the regularization of their status in coordination with another ministry. So the state saw its primary duty as ensuring the human right to social protection and took measures to remove obstacles to the enjoyment of that right. Thanks so much. Good to hear these good practices. So how about from Addis Ababa, Bafakadu, what, what have we learned? What can you share with us? Yeah, um, despite all the wars and uh, challenges, uh, I think there are some glimpses of hope to scale up on. Uh, first of all, uh, the pandemic is a global threat and uh, we see a lot of multilateral efforts to address the problem. And uh, we can mention the COVAX initiative, which is under the WHO. Thus, despite the confrontations between uh, the countries, uh, we do see uh, efforts to come together and uh, merge uh, their uh, fight against the pandemic. We can also uh, mention some emerging uh, partnerships between pharmaceutical companies in the developed and the developing countries. So that could also be another uh, opportunity or uh, lesson. Uh, there are also challenges which taught us that all the categories of human rights are inseparable. So we have been talking about the first, second, and the third generation of human rights. And uh, thanks to this pandemic, it clearly showed us that all the categories of human rights are inseparable. So you can't think about the right to life without uh, talking about the right to health or other socioeconomic rights. And uh, we can also mention uh, strong voices from uh, both the global and uh, regional human rights bodies. These bodies are issuing statements and the guidelines which has to be followed by states and other actors in relation to the COVID-19. Uh, another lesson, particularly in the context of developing countries like Ethiopia is uh, the encouraging role of uh, 
grassroots level public mobilization and the role of uh, the local stakeholders, particularly in my country, you see the local administrators, elders, and uh, the health extension workers playing a leading role in raising public awareness and uh, uh, in, uh, in facilitating different efforts by state and other state actors to address the challenge. And uh, this tells you uh, the role of the grassroots level actors in ensuring effectiveness of uh, any policy which aims at ensuring human welfare. Thank you very much. Abby, in, in the face of this ex existential um, crisis of climate change, extreme inequality and COVID-19, how does the future of human rights lie in greater recognition and focus on economic and social rights? Yeah, and I think um, um, it's quite nice that I've gone uh, after um, Beth Ocado here, because I think we're kind of coming at these questions from a similar angle, but I think this sort of speaks to um, what has been, a, a, I guess, a traditional, uh, to some extent, separation of the two sets of rights, civil and political rights on the one hand, and social, economic, social, culture, cultural rights on the other. And, it, you know, it has to be said that civil and political rights have tended to, to sort of get most of the attention by the big human rights organisations, at least, and, and, and kind of more, uh, more generally. And um, these sort of economic and social rights, so rights to health, work, education, I think, what these, uh, well, these three combined crises, in particular COVID-19, has really shown us is, yeah, is that kind of fragility and just how unequal our societies are, how fragile our health systems are, how fragile our kind of social protection systems are. And if human rights are going to be relevant in the face of these types of crises, uh, then they, you know, there's no escaping that we have to grapple with economic and social rights. And there are kind of a number of reasons why economic and social rights and cultural rights as well, not forgetting the sea, um, have sort of been less attended to. Um, one of them is that they are very slippery. They are super, super slippery. And so when we're kind of looking um, at sort of when these rights go violated, it's a little bit trickier to identify and I'll perhaps talk a little bit about that uh, later. Um, but yeah, I think if they're going to be relevant, we're going to have to kind of deal with this slipperiness. They have, you know, they're entailed by an obligation to fulfill these rights to the maximum of available resources. Well, what are maximum available resources? How do we determine what they are? And kind of is policy implicated in that? Um, so yeah, there's still a huge amount of work to do on the uh, economic, social and cultural rights front. Um, but I think there's no escaping from, from kind of grappling with those issues if, if human rights are to be you know, relevant going forward. Thanks, Abby. Um, the historian Samuel Moyne has written that the purpose of international human rights is to make the world a little less wicked. How can we leverage human rights norms and laws to make the world a, a little less wicked, as Moyne recommends? Abby, I'm going to come back to you and ask you what would a rights based approach to post COVID 19 and the, and the COVID 19 recovery look like? Yeah, so I think I'll, I guess, pick up a little bit again on some of the points I've made previously, but there is a, it's actually a nice report um, on a rights-based economy that's just come out from the Centre for Economic and Social Rights. So they're a brilliant outfit, so go and check them out if uh, you're interested in this kind of thing. And I'll try and do um, some justice to the main arguments that that report makes here, but essentially kind of what they're, what this report is saying is that what a rights-based approach to recovery looks like is is really a fundamental shift in the way that we organize our political economy um, and so it would involve um, policy that respects planetary boundaries um, instead of sort of facilitating the exploitation of resources it would move away from measures of economic growth to more sort of human-centered measures of success um, it would definitely bring in or um, sort of account for the value of care reclaim the power of the public uh, transfer transferring power from uh, corporate monopolies and to, to workers and communities and I think all of this really requires uh, a refocusing of, of the sort of discourse um, around our political divide from uh, one that sort of focuses on left versus right um, to one that really focuses on democracy versus oligarchy and being a bit radical. There we go. <laughs> That's okay, always good to be radical. Alison, in the 1990s, there were some important gains for women and women's rights, and they were recognized as human rights, and violence against women was an issue of international concern. 
How is this framework now being challenged, particularly in the area that you work in, Latin America, or elsewhere? Can you offer any examples of the gains that have been made? Sure. Well, while the system is being challenged, I do wish to emphasize that women human rights defenders and their transnational advocacy networks have pushed to create their own norms and have made incredible use of the human rights system. Um, particularly in Latin America, we have the um, Belém do Pará Convention from 1994, which was the first binding treaty to ever address violence against women um, versus the, the 1993 declaration um, at the international level, which was non-binding. So that treaty um, has contributed to making the inter-American human rights system, well, far from perfect, um, probably the world's most developed and effective human rights system at the regional level um, in the context of violence against women. So. The convention also paved the way for the typification of, of femicide, for example, in, in national legislation in many places. So uh, that being said, I am concerned about the incursion of um, religious fundamentalists who have their own transnational networks and fundamentalists from many different faith traditions um, in these human rights spaces. Um, I was shocked to see um, how many anti-abortion, anti-rights people were participating in the human rights table at the OAS assembly in Santo Domingo a few years ago, for example. Um, so they are attempting to roll back women's rights to sexual and reproductive health by changing the very meaning of what is meant by the human right to life. Um, so AWID, the uh, Association for Women's Rights and Development has done important research on this as part of their rights at risk initiative. And uh, the efforts to roll back rights already won has kept women's rights activists really on the back foot for several years now, um, defending existing rights rather than being able to advance their, their rights agenda. And, and all of this is happening as many women human rights defenders, um, indigenous women like Berta Cáceres in Honduras are losing their lives in attempts to defend the land and, and women's bodies from exploitation because they're making those connections. Thanks so much. And Beth Cato, you've talked about the uh, marginalization that we saw during the pandemic. Post-pandemic, with all these ambitious economic reforms and dealing with all the pivoting that has to go on, what do you see as the key areas of, of human rights or possibly human rights violations that we should be looking at? Yeah, uh, as... As we said, the pandemic has resulted in massive economic downturn and uh, to, to deal with that, the state has to take a lot of uh, measures and uh, they have to create millions of jobs. They have to deal with the issue of external debt, particularly in the context of developing countries. And uh, these countries also has to attract investors, foreign investors. So uh, this, uh, may force them to, uh, to look for uh, policy measures like privatization and uh, other neoliberal schemes. And uh, we do know uh, the debates ongoing regarding the impact of privatization and uh, neoliberalism on human rights. So the developing countries in order to uh, like, uh, ensure job access to the millions of unemployed uh, in order to attract hard currency, in order to attract foreign investors. They may have to resort to policy measures, which may do have a lot of negative implications on human rights. So I'm not taking side regarding the, the impact of neoliberalism on human rights, but there are uh, doubts and concerns regarding the impacts of privatization and uh, neoliberal reforms on human rights. So I fear such things may happen in developing countries like that of mine. Thank you for those insights. Jeff, have there been any recent international developments that could lead to better genocide prevention? Yeah, uh, I, I want to quickly comment on uh, something uh, you know, that Abby was talking about. Um, so I'm extending my timer here. Um, you know, cultural genocide um, during the negotiations was equated to burning books by the states that opposed it. And I just think it sort of adds to this idea that cultural rights are not as important as civil and political rights and how they're often treated that way. 
Um, some of the negotiations were also openly talking about assimilation as if it, you know, regardless of the cultural impacts of the groups being, you know, quote unquote, assimilated. Uh, Pakistan even said assimilation is a euphemism for genocide during, during those negotiations. Um, I do have some optimism, though, in, in one element, so to add to some of the positivity, um, you know, the International Court of Justice and state responsibility for genocide, you know, the Bosnia versus Serbia case was precedent setting. Um, but now we see in the case of the Gambia versus Myanmar, where, you know, there's essentially, I would argue, a form of universal accountability. Um, you know, genocide is, um, you know, something that the entire international community has an interest in preventing. Uh, and that the Gambia has standing to bring a case from Africa against the country in Southeast Asia, I think, is a really important development. Now, uh, to temper some expectations there, the other problem is, though, is that reservations are permitted. If you think about reservations to the Genocide Convention, but to human rights treaties more broadly, it all began back in 1951 when there was a question about whether reservations could be submitted uh, by parties to the Genocide Convention. And the ICJ actually allowed this, and that has actually allowed states that are parties to the Genocide Convention to submit reservations to Article 9, which gives the ICJ, uh, stop making that noise, uh, gives ICJ jurisdiction. So, uh, so the United States and China, as two major examples, have Article 9 reservations, which means the ICJ cannot really hear cases brought against those two states for uh, accusations of genocide. Thank you. Of course, norms and laws are wonderful, but without enforcement, they're like everything, just words on paper. So, Alison, let me come back to you. We focused a lot on the challenges to human rights. What about the mechanisms for defending them? I know you've been an expert contributor for many of these thematic consultations with treaty bodies and special rapporteurs. How have you seen these mechanisms being used to ensure the continued relevance of human rights to geopolitics today? Sure. Um, well, my research draws on the, the UN Human Rights Framework protecting migrants' rights, women's rights, and children's rights in particular, as well as the conventions on the elimination of racial discrimination and statelessness. So I've participated in these different expert consultations with the committees on migrant workers, um, committee on the rights of the child, um, contributed to the CEDAW reviews. And um, just next week, I there's a thematic consultation with a special rapporteur on, on violence against women uh, regarding statelessness. So in case people aren't familiar with these mechanisms, um, the treaty bodies uh, review states' progress on meeting their obligations in the conventions they've signed on to. Um, so the review process becomes a way for civil society and academics and international organizations and others to, to hold states accountable uh, to meeting those obligations. Uh, the committees also issue guidance to states on how to interpret and implement the provisions of each convention in light of emerging issues. So that keeps them relevant. Um, so, for example, the CEDAW committee has issued, um, which is the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, um, has issued General Recommendations 26 on women migrant workers, or 32 on the gender dimensions of refugee status, asylum, nationality, and statelessness on women. Um, and in 2017, I was at the expert consultation in Mexico City, convened by uh, the committees on uh, migrants and children, and I was thrilled to see text um, that I contributed regarding birth registration for children, uh, regardless of their parents status taken up directly um, in the joint general comment on the human rights of children in the context of international migration. So I offered these examples because um, um, I don't I think it's too soon to sound the death knell on <laughs> on the international uh, human rights frameworks and their mechanisms. I think many of us are are working to make the world a little less wicked um, and making use of these mechanisms helps keep the framework for action robust and relevant. Absolutely. Jeff, in, in this context and in the context of atrocity crimes, is there a hierarchy of international crimes that impact human rights and security? Um, you know, educate us on that. <laughs> uh, I would argue that that there is um, you know, genocide is treated as the crime of crimes and I think um, there are you know reasons that we could point to why that is um, you know the intent to destroy a group but it also has um, genocide is in some ways depoliticized so it's removed the crime from other potential objectives uh, and I think it adds to a hierarchy in which genocide is at the top uh, arguably fire uh, sorry um, followed by crimes against humanity an ethnic cleansing. I think war crimes um, probably sits at, at the bottom of this hierarchy. And 
Um, you know, this creates uh, issues for accountability, for uh, reparations, restitution, historical memory, and so on, when some cases of violence and human suffering are treated as more severe and more urgent than others. And it's not that I think genocide should be treated less urgently, uh, but rather that other crimes against civilian populations um, ought to be treated, um, you know, with the same um, severity and urgency. Uh, Dirk Moses, a historian at, that's now in, at University of North Carolina, has a book called The Problems of Genocide, Permanent Security in the Language of Transgression. Uh, and uh, just a quick quote, I think, exemplifies this. He wrote, quote, what is the exper experiential difference between a victim of genocide and a victim of collateral damage? Both are innocent. And I think we should treat human suffering that way in all regards. Great point. Befficato, uh, what factors, in light of what you're fellow panelists have said, what may shape the future of human rights, um, especially the perspective that you're coming to human rights from? Okay, so as regards to the future of human rights, particularly in, in the light of the pandemic related challenges and the new developments, I think we need to ask some basic questions. First, um, which country or group of countries may may come out strong, mostly in economic sense, in the post-COVID era is important. Second, uh, how the existing regional and global human rights mechanisms respond to the new developments and the challenges is also important. In addition, uh, we see, currently we see uh, increasing role of uh, the non-state actors such as multinational pharmaceutical companies and uh, the, the philanthropic organizations. And uh, on the other hand, as we know, the existing international human rights system primarily focuses on the states. So uh, certainly, I think we need to ask how the existing human rights frameworks can reorient themselves to firmly embrace uh, the emerging uh, non-state actors. So by asking such questions, I think we can understand or we can identify factors which may shape uh, the future of human rights in light of uh, the challenges and the new developments. Abby, from your perspective, what, what uh, new methods of human rights advocacy do we need? Uh, yeah, and I think it speaks to that, um, the sort of the role of non-state actors in this, but of course, kind of going back to the, the, the sort of the, the way in history that human rights have been advocated for and, and kind of uh, brought attention to, it's, it tends to be this sort of naming and shaming variety in response to these sort of civil and political rights violations. Um, but these type of methods, I think, if we are going to be focusing more on um, economic, social and cultural rights, which are sort of the argument that I've been presenting, these types of naming and shaming methods are, are going to be, um, I would say, of, of a kind of limited success. Um, so yeah, we will need new methods. And why might they be of limited success? Well, these methods, you know, we need to be able to identify a clear violation in legal terms, uh, a clear violator, um, and, a, and a remedy that we can point to to sort of advocate for. So economic and social rights don't really give these facts up easily. Um, Kind of beyond that, I think also we can do better in terms of sort of focusing more on preventative approaches rather than sort of uh, after the fact type approaches. Um, and this is where human right impact assessments could play a role, so long as they sort of look at the right things. And by the right things, I mean uh, economic policy and the kind of political economic forces that underpin it. Um, kind of to wrap things up as well, I kind of want to make the point that um, I don't think human rights can do everything. So um, I don't think human rights by themselves are really going to be enough to face these challenges and the crisis that we're kind of dealing with at the moment. And uh, we are going to need other ideals, other projects. Um, and I just hope that we're kind of, or at least the trick is going to be how do we make room and space for both of these types of enterprises and that one doesn't kind of get stifled for the sake of the other, because I think that human rights have their place. But yeah, there are probably limits to its, uh, to its reach and possibilities. Great point. Stephen Hopgood wrote a book that came out a few years ago entitled The End Times of Human Rights. He argues that the world has changed and that he calls official human rights, meaning human rights that uh, are codified in international law and enforced by the international system, are no longer fit for purpose in the 21st century. 
So is he right? Jeff? Um, I can't say for sure whether he's right. Uh, I, I did want to um, just add to the you know, recent developments um, and with the responsibility to protect as another uh, sort of recent development. Um, and, uh, you know, R2P does address a lot of the textual deficiencies that were in Genocide Convention, including intent, uh, the limited on number of protected groups and so on. Um, but it also is still a political document. Um, you know, at the World Summit in 2005, uh, the heads of state, um, sorry, endorsed that there is a responsibility to protect against genocide, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, war crimes. But they also said that, you know, it's going to go through the same international system that pre-existed. It's going to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And, uh, you know, it's really in a lot of ways a unidirectional um, document, at least in, in practice. Uh, so just to, some real quick data for you. Um, in the US, the UK, and France, um, between 2007 and 2020, there were 138 resolutions Security Council that referred to R2P uh, in, in direct or slightly fragmented form. And neither China nor or China authored any of those 138 resolutions. Um, the United States did 72 of them, France 92, the United Kingdom 64. And these were all aimed at the Middle East and uh, in African states. Um, so R2P still in a lot of ways, I would argue, is used to protect the interests of certain states. Uh, and China and Russia, as long as it's not used against them, are, I think, typically willing to uh, to stay out of it unless there's some forceful measure that, that would be called for against one of the states that falls within their sphere of influence. So, Thank you so much. Um, Allison, if you were to uh, flag or name one major challenge at this moment of time and one major opportunity for enhancing rights protection, which one would you, would you flag? Well, first, going back to Stephen Hopgood's argument, as I mentioned earlier, I, I would not be as quick to, to sound the death knell on unofficial human rights. I think, yes, the system has been undermined by many of the forces he names in his book, but, but his privileging of local and national activism over the international NGOs overlooks the fact that many local um, rights defenders actually make strategic use of international norms in alliance with the big ones, Amnesty or Human Rights Watch. So separating out the local from the global is really a futile task at this stage of globalization, um, as scholars of global governance will be quick to point out. Um, but since you asked me to flag uh, a major challenge um, at the present time, it's hard to choose only one, but I would actually flag an old one that Hannah Arendt wrote extensively about, um, that the protection of human rights continues to rely on the recognition of citizenship. So going back to my initial intervention, um, so this inherent contradiction in the international human rights framework itself becomes even more pressing today in light of unprecedented levels of human mobility and displacement. So the very first line describing this session of Global Insights says that human rights define the relationship between citizens and the state. So what about migrants who are non-citizens where they live? What about stateless people who cannot or have yet to be recognized by any state? Were those issued these ad hoc documents who are recognized and identified in ways that categorically infringe on their human dignity and rights? So, so that's the major challenge. And then the major opportunity for enhancing rights protection, without romanticizing it, of course, I would say communications. Um, turning a cell phone camera on to witness police brutality against people of color is a powerful example of this. Um, just yesterday, a TikTok video came to my phone of migration authorities raiding maternity hospitals in Santo Domingo to round up Haitian women who were pregnant or who had just given birth. Um, babies screaming, they were rounded up onto a bus pending deportation to Haiti, which is in a critical state of crisis and may be unsafe for them to bring their babies into this world. So images like that um, help other humans to awaken to the rights violations taking place under our noses even if Hopgood doesn't like it. <laughs> um, but now can be a time to recognize our, our fragility, um, I think, as humans on this planet and our mutual need for protection of our rights. Abby, with whom does future of human rights lie, according to your work? Um, yeah, I think the commitment to human rights by governments is uh, hugely fragile if it exists at all in many countries and I think it's sort of a sort of a political fact that those impositions in power are never really going to have human rights as their sort of principal preoccupation you know there'll always be a range of other objectives that if it comes to it um, will kind of trump human rights but 
Does that necessarily mean that Hopgood is right? I would say no, and I'm kind of uh, going to speak to some of Alison's points here. I think um, for human rights proponent, proponents, um, we've always faced this sort of uphill struggle, so it isn't necessarily something uh, to be super pessimistic about. Um, but I think if, <clears throat> if human rights are going to have any future, and if they are going to remain relevant uh, in the 21st century, um, then that kind of future depends on really changing people's understandings of things, uh, challenging dominant political and economic discourses, and um, yeah, to kind of reiterate some of Alison's points, I think that can only be done through both these sort of bottom up as well as as well as top down interactions, and we need we, we need both of them. And I've asked the question many times to quite a few special rapporteurs, you know, when we're all feeling a bit depressed about our own research area, thinking, you know, what are, what are human rights for? Or should I still be working on this stuff? Um, and they come back and they say, well, yeah, human rights in you know in these documents, it does give legitimate to folks who can then go out and advocate for for these issues for these abuses and so I think it is this sort of these bottom-up top-down interactions that are really necessary um, if one we're thinking about. Hey, Beth Ricardo, what, what measures can be go as far. in place in your view? Uh, thank you as I have mentioned uh, the developing countries to have a lot of burden related to the to the threats caused by the pandemic. So uh, the measures the governments take to address those challenges has to be, has to follow uh, the rights-based approach. So we can mention the issue of uh, corporate social responsibility, and uh, we can also mention the, the role of good governance in its broadest sense. So attempts to create jobs, attempts to attract investors, attempts to, uh, uh, increase hard currency, all those economic measures has to be based on basic human rights principles. And um, from the human rights uh, perspective, I think we need to revitalize or uh, revisit the UN system. Uh, we do have the UN Human Rights Council, we do have the UN uh, treaty bodies, we do have also the UN special procedures mechanisms. So I think these bodies under the UN has to be uh, revitalized or reoriented. And uh, uh, we can also talk about intrasystem dynamism in the existing uh, human rights frameworks. Particularly, we can mention the experience of the European Court on Human Rights in this regard. So uh, we need dynamic institutions like the European Court on Human Rights who can address uh, which can address the new developments in a very innovative way. And uh, I also argue for uh, intrasystem uh, collaboration and the learning. We do have the African regional system, we do have the European system, we do have the inter-American system. So there could be something these systems can share from one another. And uh, lastly, I want to mention uh, the need for depoliticization of human rights. So I advocate human rights shall not be a weapon a government uses to, uh, to attack uh, unfriendly regime or unfriendly government somewhere else. So uh, as we know, such a trend has been affecting uh, the protection and the proportion of human, uh, international human rights for the, since uh, the Second World War. Um, can I push back at you, Befficato, because there's a very good question that's been posted on the Q&A panel about the rights of nomads in an age where border security and closures have been somewhat normalized and militarized. And, you know, you come from a part of the world, or you're certainly speaking to us from a part of the world where there are many pastoralist groups and, and mobile communities. Um, uh, that follow grazing patterns and, and broad, broader resource patterns. So what do you think about those groups and their rights in this age that we're living in? Yeah, I think the major uh, challenges related to the artificial nature of the borders. And uh, if you see the border between Ethiopia and Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia, Ethiopia and Sudan, so we do have millions of pastoralists who don't, who actually, they don't know this artificial boundary line. So they move wherever they could get land and the water for their uh, 
uh, castle. And uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the boundary lines are artificial. And uh, uh, another factor is the governments lack a kind of coordinated uh, policies aimed to address uh, the development challenges in those areas. So the communities in those areas are a bit marginalized and uh, there is no uh, comprehensive schemes by all the concerned states. So in such a situation, uh, like all the, all the challenges they are going through are expected and uh, now uh, uh, the state capacity is being eroded by this pandemic and uh, the resources are, which are assumed to be allocated to those people are being diverted to other sector. So their life is increasingly under threat and uh, currently there is also drought, shortage of rain and uh, siting, which has resulted in displacement of hundreds uh, hundreds of thousands in, in border area between Ethiopia and Kenya. Thank you very much. Jeff, um, there's a question from Hewitt Gebermarian uh, about uh, standards for governance that human rights frameworks recommend in order to prevent the chance of genocide. So what type of governance would you recommend um, to, to ensure that you know, citizens are protected regardless of ethnic, racial, religious background. Um, an example is given what sort of prevention measures through human rights standards can be taken to avoid this? Um, and this is not a, a main area of, of study for me. I would say that, um, you know, I tend to be more supportive of, um, of social, social democratic governance. Um, that's not to say that they don't have issues um, in, among uh, different groups and populations. I just think that there's uh, certain things that exacerbate differences among different groups of peoples, and that can include, um, you know, uh, incitement, of course, the more direct things, uh, incitement to violence and others, but there's also, uh, you know, climate change, economic issues, cultural rights, and I think that, um, you know, a sort of comprehensive approach to um, helping people not live in dire situations uh, is, a, is, is, you know, something that I would advocate. I know it's a, a, a large project, um, but uh, yeah, sorry if I didn't do uh, better on that. No, 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 that's fine. Thanks for shedding some light on it. And, and others can uh, in, in these final comments. Alison, a uh, last question from the audience. Um, you mentioned the rise of fundamentalism. We don't currently have international human rights law that explicitly recognizes the rights of the LGBTQ plus communities, although the special procedures have done a lot of work on the rights of these communities. So in your view, might this gap be filled anytime soon? Thanks for the question. Um, well, there has been a, a lot of progress in, in recent years uh, making use of um, international human rights um, to address um, violence against um, people on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, I know the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights has been working with states, with national um, human rights institutions, civil society to, to repeal laws criminalizing LGBTQ um, persons and, and also to adopt further measures to um, protect them from violence and discrimination. Um, a number of treaty bodies have also addressed uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity in their general comments, um, in their concluding observations to states. Um, Human Rights Council has issued um, a resolution, also the first UN resolution um, addressing this. Um, but that being said, there has been, because of all of these, this use of the human rights framework to address these issues, um, there has been a lot of pushback from uh, fundamentalist groups who are against so-called, uh, both so-called gender ideology and also LGBTQ rights. Um, so the pushback's real. We saw it in uh, the negotiations of the Global Compact for Migration, um, where all mention of protection of LGBTQ individuals, as well as sexual and reproductive rights and health uh, were removed from the final draft of that document. Um, it's really hard at the present time to get any new treaties, any new binding um, conventions. So um, given that context, I, I think I would say the best hope at the present time is making use of these existing conventions and treaty body review processes 
Um, I, I don't think that we should limit our uh, efforts to that, but I think that um, we should recognize what is being done and keep doing it. Great, thanks for enlightening us on that. Um, if all of you were to stand in front of a policy audience, uh, and, and admittedly, there are some policymakers in the audience today, what would be your top takeaway to share with them? Abby, let's start with you. Um, I think if you care about human rights, then you also have to care, or at least collaborate with someone care, who cares about economic policy, or at least economic policy alternatives. Um, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Very important. Jeff, how about you? Uh, two, two quick ones. Uh, I think uh, working to um, you know, get rid of the ICJ um, permission, or sorry, yeah, the, yeah, the permission to have um, reservations against Article 9 uh, to give it full uh, authority over state responsibility for genocide, and also especially for countries in the global north to take um, the time to recognize and think about accountability for historical crimes that have been committed instead of always looking elsewhere. Thanks very much. Perfecto. I could shortly say work with all the stakeholders from the grassroots to the international level. So collaboration is the way out. And uh, Alison, wrap us up. Well, my advice from where I currently sit in Canada is about policy coherence domestically and internationally with regards to human rights. Um, in Canada, respect for human rights is often part of our a diplomatic approach as the way um, this country exercises soft power in the world. Um, and I think taking up human rights considerations as part of trade and development talks is an important strategy, but there's also a risk of commodifying rights through rhetoric or strategic selection of some rights concerns while ignoring others. So um, human rights are made central to negotiations with China, for example, but not Cuba, which has a dictatorship engaged in mass repression youth activists jailed as political prisoners while attempting to bring democracy to the island. So I would just say there are opportunities for Canada to be more consistent and coherent in its international leadership on human rights and um, also to make good on fulfillment of rights here at home for indigenous people, racialized people, and even stateless people whose citizenship has been, has been stripped. And the final thing I'll say is um, that um, Canada can also um, make good on its promise to hold its international mining corporations accountable for their human rights abuses in, in Guatemala, in Brazil, Dominican Republic, Eritrea, elsewhere. Thank you so much for all of uh, those wonderful comments. Thank you to the panelists for what I'm sure the audience will agree was a great discussion. We hope everybody enjoyed it. Please join us next week for our final episode of the season entitled governing COVID fatigue, the politics of a pandemic-weary world. Until then, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much. <laughs>